look at this beauty here. The Rio Cinema, Burnham on Crouch. I think it opened in 1931. What a gorgeous little cinema. Incredibly romantic, isn't it? My first look at Burnham on Crouch on this lovely, still, spring-like morning. A town I didn't reach when I set out for here mm, nearly exactly three years ago. plaque here near the quay, or on the quay I should say. This plaque honours the men of Burnham on Crouch who on the 30th of May 1940 risked their lives to rescue hundreds of soldiers from the beaches of Dunkirk. And this boat here looks like it's a Dunkirk era boat to me. So in, back in, I think it was in 2019, it would have been 2019, I set off, I got off the train too early basically. I was planning to walk along the, uh, the River Crouch from North Fanbridge to here, to Burnham on Crouch, but <laughs> I got off at South Woodham Ferriers. It was a great walk, I'll link to it below. In fact, actually, it's in my top five great walks. And I've always meant to come back and finish the walk. But what I thought I would do instead is, today I've got the train to Burnham on Crouch, and from here I'm gonna walk around the Dengue Peninsula, not all of it. It's, I probably haven't got enough daylight and there's no, there's no real transport back from uh, the other side of the peninsula. There's a bus that runs about once every three days, I think, something like that. <laughs> so I can see this video, who knows where this video goes, it might become a disaster. But um, I don't really care. I'm just so great, it's just so great to be out here, out on the Crouch Estuary. And then we're gonna walk, hopefully, beside the North Sea, around the, around the salt marshes, along what's said to be the most remote place in England. The River Crouch is a truly great river, a really romantic river, a river of stories as are all rivers, rivers of stories, but that doesn't diminish the power of each individual one. If you, if you look on the internet, you'll see <laughs> A book, you go on Abe Books or eBay, you'll find a book called Rivers of England, written in the 1950s. The name of the author? John Rogers. White Hart Hotel here, overlooking the wide part of the, of the River Crouch Estuary, and it looks like a great place to have a pint on a stormy winter's night, telling stories of the sea. The anchor, again, wow, that'd be a great place to go, wouldn't it? Sit out there in the summer. Winter, the white heart, summer, the anchor. How about that? Burnham locals, have I got the right way around? Hey, it's, it's such a beautiful day today. I'm sort of slightly overdressed in my puffy jacket, but I'm not so foolish to think as I won't need it later on this afternoon when this morning sun disappears and uh, the afternoon comes down. Look, I'm even rarely going, I'm going a little bit hatless here. I did for a moment regret not bringing sun cream. Back there in the town, it was the sun full on your face. They make the most of this little bit of built up area, some people, some buildings, because once we leave the town, I don't think there's anything until you get to the remote chapel at St. Peter's Chapel at Bradwell on Sea. And we're not going as far as Bradwell on Sea, I don't think. That's not the plan anyway. So um, yeah, it's gonna be very remote after here. Don't worry, I've brought sandwiches. Burnham on Crouch is well known as being a, a great town for yachting, a real center of yachting, and you can see why. There's such a beautiful river out here. I can't tell you how good it feels to have warm sun on your face <laughs> after the winter. It's just, oh, it's just stunning. Absolutely stunning. The Royal Corinthian Yacht Club. The Royal Corinthians Yacht Club there looks like it'd be a really fine Art Deco building, but it's kind of sheathed in scaffolding at the moment. It looks like it's getting a lick of paint. 
What a fine sort of 20s, 30s building that is. Look at that. Reminds me of Marine Corps in uh, St. Leonard's. Recently, I've just been, um, I've been digitizing some old VHS tapes. The footage I shot when, uh, when I first met my wife in Australia, in Sydney, in the mid nineties, a long time ago. And it's been really beautiful to revisit that time, but it's also the striking feature is the sea. You know, we live down in Bondi, right near the Tasman Sea, part of the Pacific Ocean. And there's some beautiful footage of when we took trips up the coast to a place called Bluey's Beach, and then we went to Byron Bay. And it really sort of brought home to me how much I had, you know, that period of my life where I was right next to the ocean. And it, I couldn't imagine leaving it, actually. And of course, my wife, that's where she grew up. You know, she grew up in Sydney, right, with uh, spending all her holidays and basically a whole of her life right in the sea swimming on the beach uh, it's been really beautiful to revisit it so i think that was part of the, the kind of fuel to get out here today because we do have beautiful wide open stretches of water and also the marshes as well are an amazing expanse that you can kind of fill with your imagination So we basically left the town now of Burnham on Crouch. And so, and I think it's just us now, just me and you for the rest of the way until we get to Southminster station early evening. Sunsets at around six o'clock, I think. So great day ahead. The skeletal remains of boats are gonna be a real feature of this walk, I believe. Something almost impossibly romantic about them, isn't there? Oh, I love this shot. This is already a really, really, really beguiling landscape, isn't it? When we were in um, Manningtree last year, walking along the Stour Estuary out to Harwich, when was that? I think that, I feel like that was September, was it September, August, September? Wow, what a walk that was. I think it's a consistent theme here, isn't it? I think the estuary walks are always incredibly memorable, the landscapes they produce. But of course, Manningtree is famous for being the home of Matthew Hopkins, the witch finder general. And there's something about this landscape, which you sort of, I don't know, I look at that and I think, I think of this, or I think of the Civil War, I think of kind of mysterious stuff and the strange things that happened on the marshes. And this is also partly part of the, the sort of landscape of Sari Perry's The Essex Serpent. I know that's sort of uh, slightly further north, Blackwater Estuary, that way towards sort of Colchester, a little bit further, well, the other side of the estuary here, the other side of the peninsula, the, Den the Dengue Peninsula. But even so, it's got that kind of same potency. Can't wait to see, that's going to, they've adapted that for TV, actually. I can't wait to, to see that. There's a little brook here on its way to make its confluence with the crouch. And then just behind that, there's like an enormous soda farm, isn't there? Look at that. It's a real shame that my mic isn't sensitive enough to pick up the bird song. There's loads of lovely twittering of birds. You can sense that they know that spring is just around the corner. We'll probably get snow now I've said that, won't we? It's just amazing to be out here. <laughs> it's just the overwhelming sensation of kind of, of liberation. That's what walking is for me. Sometimes people say, why do you walk? Walking is freedom. It's very simple freedom. Just put one foot in front of the other and keep going. <laughs> Thank you. 
It's funny, I was reading a blog post last night by a guy who did this walk pretty much the same time of the year, 15 years ago, early March 2007. And he talked about the kind of, the unchanging landscape almost, that you walk along this defensive wall here, this flood defence wall, and you've got the marshes to your left and the, and the estuary and then the North Sea to your right. But there's something really meditative about this, you know, you can lose yourself in a landscape like this. Something really powerful and potent about walking towards the North Sea. It's quite different than when you're walking towards the Channel. It's wild and expansive, isn't it? Look at those birds dancing in the air over the marshes there, and then settling on that bush. It sits on the bank of that little creek. Such are the scenes of the marshes of the Dengue Peninsula. So here we have one of the really interesting features on this walk. There's a World War II pillbox there that's built into this bank, this flood defence here. I think it juts out on the other side. I love finding little relics in the landscape like this. God, I love this landscape so much. It's properly seduced me. It must have deities dwelling here, casting their spells. Here's another pillbox here, but this one is only facing inland. By the way, for the, <laughs> for the record, I've, uh, I've got the beanie back on now, so <laughs> it was lovely whilst it lasted back there and I feel like I filled up my, my body with some much needed vitamin D, but now we're, we're back to winter attire. This is uh, the first footpath sign that I've seen today. Pretty unnecessary really, there's only, <laughs> there's only really two options. You can walk along this bank here and then every now and again you come across a little road or a footpath and you can go inland. I have brought my mat with me, I haven't needed it so far. I will need it eventually, in about four or five hours time. And there's another pillbox up here, which seems to be being used by, uh, by a fisherman. And there are, there are a couple of fishermen along here now, some, so some other human beings. I went a full hour and a bit without seeing anybody. Well, this is a very curious looking structure. I'd say it's quite apparently part of the Second World War defences, but I've never seen a pillbox like that before. I'll have to look it up when I get home. I know there's, there's a Wikipedia page which shows you all the different types of pillboxes and there were lots of different designs. This is, a, this is a completely new one on me. It's like it's got a face. It's got a carriage. I can imagine it coming alive and striding across the marshes to fight the invading German forces. I don't know if you can see that plume of smoke there. We're looking across to Foulness Island, which is a military testing range, and there was just an enormous explosion. Maybe jump out of my skin. Look, I think there's, I don't know, did it come from the water maybe? Wow. That was, <laughs> that was intense. I'm imagining it's an artillery round anyway, it might not be. There was another one, I just missed it. That is some distance away. I'll try and work out how far away it is, but it's right on the other side of the estuary there. It's a few miles away. And wow, when that went off, you feel it in your belly and in your ribs. It was like, <gasps> you think, Makes you think of Ukraine, of course, and what's happening there at the moment, and civilian populations having that go off around them. Well, not just civilians, aren't, you know, military personnel as well, whoever you are, if that goes off near you, wow. I can't imagine what that would be like. So we're coming up to the end of the estuary now. 
you can see it actually just at the end of the frame. I'll zoom in a little bit. And that's when we get to the North Sea and we turn north. So this pillbox here, I think, marks the end of the river, the end of the estuary. And this is where the River Crouch makes its confluence with the North Sea. And there's a little bit of discussion sometimes about how far an estuary extends out into the sea, but I think this is a, I think this is that point. From this point on, we turn north along the sea wall here, and we've got the North Sea to our right. What an incredible spot this is. What a magical moment. So now, we just walk along this sea wall north and keep going. I think Bradwell on Sea is about eight miles, which I could walk in the light. The only thing is, well, actually, it doesn't matter if it's dark. Anyway, I've got a headlamp. But the only thing is, I think, uh, I don't know, actually, when the last bus leaves Bradwell on Sea to get back to uh, Burnham on Sea, or in fact, even to Southminster. I have a feeling that it's quite early. I think it's about five o'clock. Might even, be, uh, might even be 4 30. after that there's nothing and it's 10 miles across the lands there to get to burnham on crouch or southminster in the dark would be quite challenging and also that would be 25 miles for the day so hmm, you know i may make a bad decision today <laughs> like when i last walked along the crouch something about this landscape does something to me it draws me in and seduces me and I feel lost within it. So who knows, what the plan for today was to walk up here and there's a couple of footpaths. I think there's only two that lead inland towards Southminster. So that's my intention, but we'll make a decision when we get there. If I make good time, then maybe, maybe we'll push on. Who knows? It's pretty cold now, by the way, it's pretty cold. I love it here. <laughs> And here the path changes and now we've got a, a concrete path along the top of the sea wall. I wonder how far this extends. I'm going to keep saying it about such a strange, uncanny landscape this is to be walking along. Sometimes people have asked me whether I listen to music when I walk and the answer to that is, is no. <laughs> Today is actually an exception because it's such a massively expansive landscape and relatively unchanging for long stretches. I have been um, listening to a wonderful um, playlist of music by Joanne Robertson. I'll link to it below. It's on, um, it's on Wire magazine's website. It's just perfect for this landscape. Over the last few years, I've really developed a love of the sort of North Essex coast up along the Suffolk coast as many of you will have will have noticed from various videos and blog posts from the last I don't know eight nine years and it's a, it's a love of this area that my that my wife shares as well and actually my whole family and uh, and it's interesting I was thinking about what you know what is it you know that distinguishes this from say like the Kent coast which isn't that far away and you wouldn't think it was that different but it feels completely different and I think it's this it's the sea it's the North Sea is distinctly different from the channel the channel is you know not a very wide stretch of water France is just the other side and obviously all the historic links between between Britain and France whereas the North Sea is a much larger expanse of water. I'm overusing the word expanse. Somebody will mention that in the comments. But you know, it was from over the North Sea that, that you know, the Anglo-Saxons came, that people walked <laughs> across the land bridge. So the first sort of permanent settlers in Britain were people who walked across the land bridge that was swallowed by the North Sea. And then of course, the, the Viking raiders, the Danes, they crossed the North Sea. It feels like I don't know, it's got a different intensity to me. It go, well, look, you'd have, <laughs> you'd have picked up by now the way it's made me go a little bit uh, incoherent. I mean, more incoherent than, than usual. Um, 
I love it. I love it. I feel very, uh, I feel very at home here. There you go. There's an indicator of just how uh, windy it gets along here. I can see a change in the landscape up ahead. I think we're going to encounter some sand. It certainly looks that way. I wonder if we can walk on the sand. It's not a sandy beach, it's shingle, which reminds me of Orford Ness and Shingle Street up there in Suffolk where we were in October last year. That was an extraordinary walk, wasn't it? It's another one I'll link to below for those of you that haven't the faintest idea what I'm talking about. This is obviously something which has deep resonance and meaning for some people. You can see people have sort of hung these plastic containers here off this gate, this metal gate, and draped it in ropes. What's interesting is it is mentioned in the blog post from 2007, so clearly it's been here some time. I wonder what it's for. I, my guess is it's some sort of tribute to somebody. And this is the first of the paths that cuts inland towards Southminster, which is the end of the train line here. I'm obviously not going to take this one, but uh, I think there's one more. And then after that, you've got to go all the way around the peninsula to, uh, to Bradwell-on-Sea. So I think, it's, uh, I think it's time for lunch. It's uh, after two o'clock, about quarter past, half past two. So I'm going to sit on this wall and have my lunch, looking out across the North Sea and those birds bobbing around out there. People are always interested to know what you eat on a, on a walk. I'm not saying this is a standard meal, this is just what I got today because there was a Tesco's in the town. So I just got this kind of deli style um, cheese and pickles sandwich. I did the three pound meal deal, a banana, which I'll probably save for this afternoon and a bag of crisps. So not particularly, <laughs> not particularly healthy, lunch. What have we got? We've got 461 calories in the in the sandwich there. It's probably what 100 and something in a bag of crisps. So it's about so it's about 600 calories there. It's like a that's a decent that's a decent amount of calories for lunch. Not too many but not too few. It's a surprisingly decent sandwich. It's kind of got like malted brown bread. It's all right. I mean, I am tempted to go down and walk on the shingle, but I just remember <laughs> how hard it is to walk on shingle beaches from walking along the, the Suffolk coast. So I'm going to um, stay up here on the concrete path because I've got a few miles to go. I've done about eight miles and I've got at least another seven or eight to go. I haven't seen very many people since I left Burnham on Crouch. A handful of people, there were sort of three or four fishermen, saw three old, older <laughs> gentlemen on a walk. But the last person I saw and the most beguiling character was a guy on this concrete path uh, walking along here with his dog and he had he was properly rugged up like he was going to the arctic really warm jacket like padded trousers on and a, a hood over his beanie and um and he had but i was beguiled because he had a big backpack he had a big backpack with a sleeping mat rolled up on it and a sleeping bag and a proper like 50 60 litre backpack and so I thought oh god I wonder what he's doing I wonder if he's doing a long distance walk along the Essex coast and and camping because it looked like he well he had camping gear with him so and <laughs> he looked really cold that's why I didn't engage him in conversation because he sort of nodded to me but he didn't look open to my uh, my questions about his his trek but I wonder I wonder You can really see here why they call it the Salt Marsh Coast Walk, can't you? This is an amazing habitat here for birds. You can hear them. I mean, I don't, I don't think it will come out of my mic, but there is a, a loud sound, an ever-present sound of the birds. And the, uh, the path here is going in a big loop around this marshland here. Well, 
the sun's come back out again. It's still pretty cold, but it's lovely to have the sun back out. So walk along the bank now. You can see, look, the concrete path is gone. And we're walking along this quite narrow, grassy strip here with a slide down to the ditch. So we're going to go up here a bit longer beside the salt marsh and then we will uh, cross a brook and that's where we'll turn inland. We've got about five miles, I think, from at least five miles from the coast here to walk to Southminster Station. Like I say, I suppose I could risk it to go to Bradwell, but I could end up getting stranded there. I don't even know how easy it is to get a cab. So um, I think I will take the walk inland to the station. And it will actually be nice to contrast it with you know, the coastal scenery with the countryside. I love like the, the wind turbines there in the haze. Now moving into that final part of the day, I mean, it's coming up to four o'clock. So sunset at just before five. And I don't know, there's something about because I've been out here, <laughs> I've been out here alone for quite a while. I mean, obviously I've got you to talk to, but you you know, you know what I mean, like physically. <laughs> physically there's no one around. I haven't actually spoken to anybody, had a conversation with anyone since uh, since this morning, since my son went to school at eight o'clock this morning. So it's kind of um you get to this point in the day, it's kind of it feels kind of strange. It's funny, always being in landscapes like this and being out in the wilderness. Like I said, I read somewhere that they say this is the most remote part of England. And you can believe it, really. You really can. I mean, particularly when you look on a map, there isn't a lot, <laughs> there isn't a lot around. There's, there's, there's Southminster and there's another village, but they're five miles inland from here. And what you've got is salt marsh like that and the North Sea. But I think... I think doses of solitude like this are really good for you. Really good for you, uh, really good for the soul to just come out on your own for a day, no noise, and uh, just listen to your thoughts for a bit. So uh, deeply therapeutic. I'm incredibly fortunate. I know, and I'm incredibly fortunate to be able to do things like this as well. I don't take it for granted at all, not for one minute. So this is the Ashildon Brook flowing out to the North Sea. And this is the point where we need to look out now for the path that cuts inland and heads towards Southminster. The Grange outfall there. This is going to take arrows or circles or something. That's where we are. And then just up past it, there is the path that leads inland so if we can't miss that and then we're on to roads actually and we go into the village of Asheldom where interestingly there is uh, the word settlement meaning there must have been some sort of ancient settlement I know they found prehistoric settlements here and Bronze Age settlements on the peninsula so whether that's where they are and then we just get into Southminster I think that's about four or five miles I could be wrong I mean, I usually am in these matters. So we're going to have to come down off this bank so that we can get to the footpath. So it's goodbye to the sea, goodbye to the North Sea, and it's a shame that I haven't been close to it these last couple of miles, but I can feel it. I can feel it over there. And it's been so restorative to be here beside it. I will be back before too long. So I'm going to use these metal steps to get down the bank to avoid having to slide down there and risk injury. See, I'm learning, I'm getting sensible. So we walk beside the ditch here beneath the bank and not for very long, I think I can see where the path branches off to the left. And then we're going to be in quite a different landscape. I was starting to think I've made a mistake, but I can think I can see where the path cuts across this ditch or stream, whatever this is here, or a dike. So that's the path 
continuing north towards Bradwell on Sea and the ancient St Peter's Chapel. That will have to wait for another day. I don't fancy walking 10 miles through the dark to Southminster at the end of a 15, 16, 17 mile walk. Instead I'm going to take this path inland across the misty fields to Southminster. I'm really looking forward to this now. I mean the irony is Bradwell on Sea is much closer than South, Southminster Station. It's only about three miles up there and I could see St Peter's Chapel and all that business. You can do retreats there actually, I've heard, so I'd quite like to maybe do that sometime. I don't know how realistic that is. Um, but the thing is, is, as I've said many times, I think the last bus is leaving Bradwell now, heading for Southminster. After that, there's nothing. There's no transport until like nine o'clock tomorrow morning, until the school bus, basically. This is what I've, what I've read. Hence, I'm uh, gonna do the, I think it's about, well, my phone says seven miles. I don't think it's seven miles because it's not using the footpaths, it's using the roads. It's about five miles. It's like uh, quarter past four, so should do most of that in the, in the daylight. And the sun's beautiful, right, right in my face. As you can see, I'm well lit for a change. You can hear the pop of shotguns over there. I have run out of adjectives. Just this road now running parallel to the sea towards this wind turbine. Don't know if you can hear it or hear it in a minute. What a beautiful place to be walking at half past four in the afternoon. It's walking in landscapes like this at the sunset that you never forget. <laughs> These moments really stick with you and Sometimes it feels like the walk is about arriving at moments like these. Not to undermine what's gone before, but it's the whole thing. It's having a few miles in your legs, it's having the day behind you and the last few hours of light ahead. And it just, I don't know, it seems to all coalesce into this moment. And that's what burns a memory into your psyche. It's not often I'm lost for words, but I kind of am at the moment. This is so beautiful and so strange and uncanny. I don't think I've walked on a landscape like this. It's really, really stunning. This is a, a serious bit of road yomping as the final section of the walk, but I'm loving it, particularly as this stretch here is well, lots of lovely white blossom on the left. I think it's probably blackthorn given that we're in early March. And through the mist here, we can just see the village of Dengi, which either gives its name to the peninsula that we're walking on, or uh, perhaps even takes its name from the peninsula here. Either way, it doesn't raise the prospect. I wonder whether this is the original settlement. Who knows? It certainly dates back to the Doomsday Book anyway, the area. Not far to go now. We've just got the uh, village of Asheldon down here. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm sure someone will correct me in the comments. And then Southminster is very close to that. What a walk! Just coming into the village of Asheldom now. Just approaching sunset, or well, it is sunset really. It's about 5.40. And this is an ancient place of settlement. By the looks of it on the Ordnance Survey map. It's the last stretch of the road down to Southminster. And it's uh, just as well really, because it's getting dark really now. It'll be dark in the next five minutes and there's nowhere to walk here. There's a, no grass verge or pavement so 
Well, I will say everyone's been very good and giving me plenty of space as they pass. So that's good. So basically, I'm just I'm walking along holding my headlamp by my side, so at least the cars can see me. Well, that was a very long final bit of road. It isn't finished yet, with cars buzzing me the whole way and having to jump up on the tiny bit of uh, verge by the hedge and going into the brambles and all sorts. So I am very happy indeed to see this sign for Southminster. I think the station's just around the corner. Yeah. So here we are <laughs> at uh, Southminster Station. The walks end 6.35 and 20 minutes till my train goes. Well, what a, fant <laughs> what a fantastic walk that was. Certainly the longest walk I've done this year. I'm a bit, I'm a bit tired, I don't mind admitting. It's like 15.6 miles or 16 miles. So it was a good six miles from, from the, uh, the North Sea, from the, I can't even speak anymore. <laughs> I was gonna say the river, by that kind of flood defense bank from there to here. It was nine and a half miles, or 9.1, yeah, six and a half miles along the roads. I'm a bit tired, <laughs> to be honest with you, but I picked myself up a, a nice bottle of Czech lager from the uh, Nissa shop in the, in the town there to uh, ease the pain in my muscles. So thank you so much for joining me on that epic walk. That's the, I think that's, this is our first big walk outside London this year. And I think there'll be a few more. Well, there, I know there'll be a few more. There might even be a couple more in March with a bit of luck. So, um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy having a drink on the train. And as I always like to say, I look forward to seeing you in the next walk, wherever that may be. Now, I'm really hoping I've got a bottle opener <laughs> in my rucksack. I'm pretty sure I have right in the bottom.